why is it shorting sort of, you know, that's your preferred trade? Well, uh, the reason that I've studied it is that I stumbled into the matter, uh, basically a relation of mine through, him, through whom I then dealt in 1973, uh, was concerned at the amount I owed his firm in relation to the assets I had with it. So, and they were all long, my positions. I think from memory, the figure was about 28,000 pounds. Well, that would be certainly 280,000 pounds in today's money, and possibly closer to 500,000 pounds. And the underlying valuation of the relevant stocks held as collateral, those fluctuated a lot as well. And I think he thought it'd be a good idea if I were to sell some stock short uh, with a view to having some cover in the events of the market going down in general. That was a fair point. Uh, however, I found that uh, when dealing in, uh, on the short tech, one uh, didn't have to put up any money. <laughs> so, you know, as uh, young men uh, like, who like gambling, and I'm certainly in that position, uh, or was in that position, the fact is that uh, this seemed to me a novel way of uh, engaging in the stock market. So that is why I studied it. But of course, as events went on later, uh, I found that the vast majority of people were only ever comfortable uh, either being disengaged from the market or being long of the market. Well, that seemed to me silly because uh, going short really entails taking a balanced view of the market and that has proved very profitable to me. Talking about profitability, your, your career started and um, talk, talk a bit about Maxwell Communications um, and, and that, that sort of creative report that you wrote, 200 million pound loss. <laughs> uh, well, what happened there uh, was that uh, I was developing my various ideas all the while and uh, I simply did not know, for instance, about uh, securities law or anything like that, uh, a subject which greatly engages me nowadays. But uh, a friend uh, who has now long since emigrated uh, came to discuss Maxwell with me uh, at my then house in uh, St. John's Wood. And I well remember uh, we had a brainstorming session which went on for several hours uh, on what would happen if uh, Maxwell Communication Corporation's results to 31st of March 1990 uh, were rewritten. I, when we, start, we started with the accounts of signed off, I hasten to add, by uh, Coopers and Librand, <laughs> and uh, it then meant reconsidering uh, all the transactions involved. For instance, um, it had never occurred to me that anyone could or would do this, but uh, to make uh, profit uh, on uh, foreign exchange transactions, Maxwell would simply just fly over to Switzerland and uh, get a couple of contract notes printed out, either long or short of uh, a forex position, on a large scale, of course. And uh, the one that uh, made a loss would be torn up, and the one that made a profit uh, would be booked to the results of Maxwell Communication Corporation. Maxwell, of course, liked to put it about that he was a brilliant judge of commercial matters. And he was in the sense that he had a rat-like cunning, but he was essentially a brainless man. He'd simply lived by deception. He had no idea how to make things in the sense of generating money. He just uh, had a, a penchant for seizing the main opportunity and being quite shameless in doing so. Uh, I don't know which lawyers or which banks in Switzerland arranged these uh, fake transactions for him, but they, I'm sure, were well remunerated. They were never at risk at any point. And uh, Maxwell just proceeded. Uh, I don't suppose it would have occurred to 
the young men auditing Maxwell Communication Corporation to question the validity of these contract notes. And indeed, at that time, I'm quite sure it would not have been the attitude of the young men doing the audit uh, to inquire any further, even if they had suspected it. After all, there's a long legal history in, in audit that an auditor uh, is a watchdog and not a bloodhound. And if the watchdog sees uh, two contract dates showing a large profit, which is followed by a large remittance from the alleged institution providing the counterparty uh, in the transaction, what business is it of the watchdog to challenge this? And indeed, I think the majority of people working uh, on the audit would, ne would never have considered this a possibility. It would simply have been a fact in relation to the papers with which they had been presented. I'm not saying for one moment that the partner in charge of Maxwell's affairs at Cooper's was a fool, anything but. Uh, I think he was well respected. But one has to remember that the mores of the time were different. These things keep on moving. A very good example of that is what transpired in uh, HSBC's, uh, was it Zurich or Geneva branch? I can't remember now, which was allegedly assisting tax avoidance. Um, well, it depends on what you mean by assisting tax avoidance. If you give a tax avoider a, a sandwich which you sell to him for a pound, does that mean you're engaging in tax avoidance yourself? I'm of the view that it doesn't mean that. It's only silly people like Margaret Hodge who seem to think it is. And society will just have to decide uh, what is a practical association with guilt uh, for, its, for itself. I, my own view is to imply that someone is guilty just because they may have been able to uh, spell sandwich. And <laughs> it is ridiculous. So I'm afraid society is going to have to grow up a bit, I think. Um, a contrarian is told he's wrong all the time as he goes against the grain. It takes a certain temperament to disregard this. Just what's your thought on that? <laughs> well, I don't think one is deliberately contrarian, but uh, I would say one is deliberately contrary. Uh, one uh, listens to an argument and then starts putting up an argument against it. That is, that, that is my, the way I think about things. So whenever I hear a government minister speaking, uh, there are two reactions I have. One, where is this chap lying? And they usually are. Uh, and if he isn't lying, uh, what is the likelihood of his proposition being sensible? And uh, there, uh, time and again, I think he's not been sensible. That's just the way I am. Nothing very original about it. Do you work with other short sellers on a particular case? Well, it depends on what you mean by working with. Uh, I certainly know quite a number of other short sellers, and I discuss matters with them, and I find that valuable. I find it very helpful to listen to other people's points of view. I mean, there, there are some really first-class short sellers around, uh, and they're intelligent people. They're not given to conceit or foolish poses or anything like that. This is not an area of life which gives any mercy to the fool. It, <laughs> it destroys them for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, to whom I am talking and why. Do you think when a firm gets a target, do, you, do others just move away or, or does everybody get on board for the kill? Sounds very dramatic. But... Well, there's a danger if everyone's getting on board, for, as you put it, for the kill, because the chances are that some people will think they've killed the stock off and then it's hit rock bottom and bounds and be quite a lot of people who are short. Uh, to which I say um, one should be cautious. <laughs>